Welcome to ADP Training, YouTube's automotive technology channel. In this channel, you'll learn all kinds of auto repair secrets, how your automobile works, and how to diagnose it. The OBD2 Scanner Simulator Trainer The OBD2 Scanner Simulator Trainer is a unique PC or laptop based software that'll train you in a variety of auto repair issues. Not only is a great tool for the students and instructors, but also for the seasoned mechanic. It is Windows XP, Vista, 7 or 8 Pro ready. Now, what is the OBD2 Scanner Simulator Trainer software download? The software is composed of three parts. 1. A full-fledged OBD2 scanner, based on our long-standing Scan1 system. This scanner site is data stream, codes, graphing, automated testing, and many other features. It is a complete virtual scanner. 2. An engine simulator window sections, with a series of PID parameters, sensor, and actuator, slider controls. This section allows you to change the engine data stream, as you please, while being reflected on the OBD2 scanner part. This section, also has a wide variety of faults, pre-programmed into it, such as lane rich condition, MAF sensor fault, MAP fault, clogged exhaust, clogged EGR, ECT code, O2 sensor fault, and much more. The idea, is to teach you how these issues reflect on the scan values, and the engine itself. 3. A component simulator window section, that shows you how, whatever you do with the engine simulator screen, reflects on the signal waveform and scanner. The component simulator, is also loaded with a bunch of sensors and actuators, that reflect what you do with the engine simulator. An example would be the injector, by changing the fuel trims, or O2 sensor parameter on the engine simulator. You can then see the effects on the component simulator. The whole three sections are totally interconnected and independent programming wise, so that whatever you do with one reflects on the scanner and component simulators as well, but not because it's programmed, but because the system detects the issues as if connected to a real car. Once in the software, you can view the data stream as you would with a regular car, and see it all, on the engine component scanner simulator screens. Change one PID parameter, and then see how the rest of the other parameters also change. There is a lot of built-in intelligence, behind the OBD2 scanner simulator trainer, such as, that it behaves like a true automobile, and whatever you do in one simulator screen, the effects are seen throughout the entire data stream. This is the only OBD2 simulator trainer on the market today. The engine simulator section, data manipulation, also reflects on the OBD2 automated tests. The automated tests is a technology developed for the Scan 1 that automatically detects issues with sensors, actuators, and systems. The OBD2 scanner simulator trainer then makes for a fantastic training and teaching tool whereby you have at the tips of your fingers a virtual automotive engine that you can manipulate with any conceivable fault and error and be able to see it all on the scanner and signal waveform oscilloscope component simulator a one-of-a-kind automotive training software made with all the possible faulty issues in mind hope you enjoy The Autoscope Simulator The Autoscope Simulator is a PC-based software, now fully updated, that runs on your Windows XP, Vista, 7, and 8 Pro computer. The Autoscope Simulator software comes with Aerial Sine Wave Data Stream pre-programmed. In other words, this is a real waveform pre-recorded during a live event, 
and not a synthetically formed waveform. The software is meant to teach and train the professional technician, or anyone interested in learning how to machine oscilloscope for automotive purposes. The software is divided into a few sections, seen here with the tabs on top. First, is the normal oscilloscope section. Here is where you can get a simple sine waveform, fixed on a time base, with adjustable voltage settings. The idea here, is for you to gain access to a single signal wave, and play around with the different display and voltage settings. You may also turn the channels on and off, expand the display, print the waveform, change the colors, and a wide array of display possibilities. Then, there's the glitch capture sections. This section, is meant to train you in how to read, defective waveforms. It is the actual autoscope simulator oscilloscope part of the software, that's actually detecting these glitches. The software comes with a faulty waveform signal pro-recorded into its memory. So, it is a real defensive waveform that you will be analyzing. Every time there is a glitch detected, the autoscope simulator, will show it to you with a point in Garo, and an explanation of why it failed, at the bottom in textual format. This is a useful section, for learning how to read signals. Then, there is the diagram hookup section. This is a simple, but concise way of showing you how to connect the oscilloscope, depending on the sensor or actuator used. Yes, the autoscope simulator software, actually shows you how to connect to the different components, using color diagrams, and textual explanations. Finally, there is the waveform database which is sold separately, but included here. This is a vast source of information, for anyone interested in learning how to read waveforms. Most signal waveforms, also come with glitch, or error explanations, on how or why the wave is faulty. This is a fantastic resource, as you can gain and learn from the actual pre-recorded, real-life signal waveforms in the hundreds of waves in the database. The Autoscope Simulator is simply a great tool to learn the intricacies of using a modern automotive oscilloscope. We hope you enjoy. So we start the design process as you can see on screen uh, by uh, pretty much on, um, on, a, um, on, a, on a software by using the computer. So uh, this is how we design the face plates, uh, the PCB, with the boards the, themselves, and the face plates are also part of the uh, uh, PCB way. You can actually do uh, these things in also in aluminum, uh, which is very nice. You know, it's this is a uh, uh, not everybody has uh, this capability. There uh, again, uh, so you up design it on your computer and you upload it uh, to them, and they pretty much build it for you. Uh, you can choose from a bunch of different uh, uh, shipping, uh, like uh, DHL, uh, FedEx, you name it. Now, uh, as you can see on screen, this is one of our latest design. This is the for the uh, DLC uh, health checker, the OBD2 DLC health uh, um, uh, connector health checker. Okay. Now, we are going to show you uh, the tolerances, and this thing has to be within half a millimeter. Uh, it has to be very tight so they're so exact that whatever you design on your on your computer uh, if you're designing a, a, a board or if you're designing a faceplate like this uh, this particular this is the scope side of, of our unit uh, and the screen the LCD screen has to fit exactly there is no room for mistakes in there uh, when the PC when the board is uh, the faceplate in this case is new we, uh, you know, it takes a little bit of a, uh, we have to pretty much snap, snap it into place, but once it's there, it's there. It's, uh, I mean, we didn't do anything to this board. We just got it, and right from the factory, everything was fitted perfect. Uh, and as you can see on screen, we're going to, we're going to fit it, we're going to snap it in, into place. Uh, and you can see how it stays just by the edge of, of the screen, of the, uh, uh, oscilloscope screen and this is the we already snapped it into place you know no big deal uh, is there this shows you the level of, of accuracy that PCB way has uh, for its boards whatever you tell them whatever you design on your, on your software and we use dip trace you know for for the for the 
for the program. Um, now on screen, we also have the second screen that we have, and we're going to talk about this unit a little bit la later on. Uh, this is an LCD screen, and again, everything snapped into place right away. Uh, not only does this this thing has the, these two screens, it has a, another um, another the controls, you know, that uh, the the actual electronics which we also design in house. This is all. Uh, it's called the OBD2 Health uh, DLC Health Checker. You can see it on our website uh, right now, autodiagnosticsandpublishing.com. www.autodiagnosticsandpublishing.com. Uh, and we're going to show you more or less the operation of this particular unit uh, in a very we're going to do more videos on this unit later on uh, and uh, as you can see on screen on the, the next shot here uh, is the the back of the unit which also made uh, a PCB way makes it we also designed our back or the our uh, back end uh, with this uh, company we design ourselves and they make it they're the factory they make it uh, so this is the unit almost assembled we're not going to pretty much assemble it because we just want to show you the fit the fitment and the operation uh, actually the uh, the build of these uh, uh, boards uh, these are PCB board uh, based faceplates and uh, and the circuit too but the circuit we're going to do another video for the circuit uh, now uh, and as you can see on screen the LBD2 DLC health checker has an oscilloscope screen uh, on the top and a menu screen on the bottom the oscilloscope screen allows you to scope all the pins uh, for the DLC for the data link connector on your car this this is unit is used for uh, pretty much for uh, U codes these are communication codes uh, and this is the actual the scope is pretty nice uh, very good we you know it we did a lot of uh, this is similar to the scopes that you see online uh, on a bunch of different places but this scope is actually we actually developed it a little bit further uh, to make sure that it captures the signal properly uh, and again uh, we're not going to go too much into the scope now uh, side of it but we're going to show you the bottom which is the the menu side of it uh, for the automatic test the automated testing uh, for the data link connector uh, the OBD2 DLC now uh, as you can see on screen uh, the the unit pretty much uh, allows you to graph or, or to scope out uh, the can high and the can low okay so what this is very very important uh, when you're doing uh, communication codes the U codes you know U1000 U there's a bunch of different U codes it's, these are all communication codes uh, and this you can do right through the scope so uh, again this is the, the, the actual menu on the unit and as you can see you can actually go through every pin from pins number 1 to 16 okay and on top of that it has automated tests for pins number 4 as you can see on screen and pins number 5 and pins number 16 okay which is this one here now it also has automatic testing for pins number 6 uh, for the CAN uh, and this is that actually has a switch on the side this unit so that you can actually inject uh, can high and can low okay and on top of that it actually it, it also positions a termination resistor in, the, in there in case you lost your resistor uh, it actually puts a resistor in there it, it'll give you a voltage for can high and can low uh, so that you can actually establish communication uh, with the with the vehicle or, or you know pretty much the network bring the network the network up uh, uh, pretty much now again uh, when you uh, scroll through the menu and you push the button, this is how you do the, the switching. Uh, only one button on this unit. Uh, for the So you turn it and you go through your uh, menu there and you switch, you choose your pin or your test and you push it. So that's how you choose it. And in this particular case, we're going to choose pin number 16. It'll do a test for 5 seconds. See? 3, 4... I didn't count right, but you know, it's five seconds. And it gives you a fail or a pass. This unit is not connected to a car, so it's not going to give you whatever you see here. It's not going to be accurate, of course. But this is this is how you actually do it. It'll do a automatic automatic testing for pins number four, five, and twelve. Uh, and it'll stress. It'll stress it. 
it'll stress the uh, uh, the, the pins number uh, number 12 which is 12 volts number four which is sensor ground and five which is chassis ground it'll stress it through a 10 ohm resistor it'll it'll draw two amps right through the uh, resistor and it'll it'll stress the circuit like we're doing another five second test here I, I don't I forgot which one it was uh, this one has a again we're not connected to a car so it's not going to be accurate okay uh, we're doing a test on the number 12, pin, pin number 12. Again, it'll do a 5 second test. It'll draw 2 amps through a 20, a, a 10 ohm resistor. Okay, in there. So you don't have to do anything. All you gotta do is connect to the DLC and you could do all these things from the C. You cannot do this f with a scanner, by the way. So don't even ask me, well, you know, do I need a scanner? No. Now, this is the CAN test, which actually. It puts a, a 20, 120 ohm termination resistor and it injects CAN low and CAN high through pins number 6 and 14, which are the CAN pins. And it tells you, uh, go to pin number 6, as so you're now viewing pin number 14, so go to pin number 6 uh, and, uh, and make sure that you see the CAN low and high in there. Uh, if you lost it, if you lost it, you're going to get communications back and this is exactly what you have to do uh, to... Uh, uh, diagnose all kinds of U codes. Okay, so again, this is the OBD2 uh, DLC health checker. So um, uh, you know, see uh, see it on our website, autodiagnosticsandpublishing.com. Uh, this uh, AQR code that you see on screen right now, you can actually scan it if you want to donate. And this, this, and that. Thank you. Welcome to another video. In today's video, we are going to talk about uh, designing the OBD2 uh, health checker. The OBD2 health checker uh, is our latest piece of equipment that we uh, actually we've actually introduced. It has a built-in uh, oscilloscope and a navigation uh, LCD screen. But before we go into that, a word from our sponsor, uh, PCBWay.com. PCBWay, it's a uh, uh, factory for PC boards. Uh, they are uh, top of the line, state of the art um, factory that you can actually go um, and order your PC boards. They do have a $5 uh, uh, prototyping, which is very nice. As you can see on screen, you can actually order your PC boards. It's very easy to get a quote, very fast, very faster than any, any other website that I've ever seen. Uh, if you look at the screen, uh, basically, you can actually uh, order SMD stencils, PCB assembly, uh, flexible PCBs, and advanced PC boards. Uh, you just input your the size of your board, the layers, and right away you get a quote. Uh, if uh, basically what you do, once you input all your uh, basic information, and it's going to ask you a couple more things, and, and we're going to see that next. Uh, hit qu uh, qu quote now, and that's it. Uh, on screen, it's a uh, the, their website, as you can see, and you can actually choose your layers, the size of the PC boards, uh, whether the PC board, uh, if you want an aluminum PC board, you can actually choose it on your web, uh, on their website, as you can see. Uh, FR4 is the, the, you know, the main uh, option that you get. You know, where everybody pretty much makes it F F FR4. Uh, which is a regular PC board, but you also have that option to do aluminum and a couple of other options, uh, as you can see on the side with the yellow arrows. Uh, you select the thickness of the PC board, pretty much anything you want in there. Uh, choose all your your finishing, you know, the colors of the stencils uh, of the uh, the silk screening, uh, and that's it. Just click the quote button, as you can see on screen, and done. Uh, you you can pretty much. Uh, and again, uh, they do have a special. Uh, for uh, for prototyping, you know, you can order. I think you can order up to twenty for thirty dollars. You know, uh, prototyping, which is very nice. Within twenty four hours, you're gonna get your PC board. That's how fast they are, and they keep you know, sending you texts. As far as uh, actually, you go to the website, and they they keep updating you as far as uh, the process. You know, if you're in an engineering process, if you're in a uh, manufacturing, and so on and so forth. As you can see on screen here. This is uh, the order that we got for the uh, uh, the DLC, the OBD2 DLC uh, health checker. Uh, this particular uh, unit, when we started out, and again, most of our designs, you know, they actually it takes us probably about two years. This one took us about a year, one one year and eight months to to develop completely. 
And as you can see on screen, we start out from a uh, uh, on a computer designing the board. Uh, before we even do that, we actually do the prototyping for the circuit. And we, on a breadboard, we, we pretty much do all the uh, uh, the components. Uh, and then we make uh, a schematic. And then from there, we go into what you see on screen, uh, which is the actual design for the board. Uh, in, um, in the software that we use, uh, we can actually see what the board is going to look like before we even make it, before we build it. Uh, this, uh, this is a very nice uh, uh, unit that we actually, it's very complicated. It's got a lot of stuff inside. Uh, now, the OBD2 health checker, uh, it's exactly what it sounds like. It'll do uh, stress testing on your on pins number four and five, which are the grounds, sensor ground and chassis ground. This is very important because if your sensor ground is not proper, uh, that means your computer is not grounded, uh, your ECM is not grounded properly, and you're gonna, you're going to have all kinds of problems. This thing would actually stress through a 10 ohm resistor. Uh, inside the unit. You don't have to do anything. Just connect the unit to the battery and connect it to the OBD2 connector. Okay. Now inside the unit you have these two resistors with a, you know, a lot of different components that actually stress. It will inject 12 volt through this 10 ohm resistor to pins 4 and 5. So it's going to draw about 2 amps through pins 4 and 5. Okay. Now that's one. It also has the same thing for pins number 16 which is also important. Uh, because pins number 16, it's important to, to drive all the uh, uh, your scanners on this and that and a bunch of other stuff too that you, you get from there. And it will do the same thing. It will it'll stress test uh, through a 10 ohm resistor to ground uh, pins number 16. It has a CAN bus inside the unit. What do we mean by that? Well, exactly what it says. There is a CAN bus that actually injects a CAN bus voltage and the uh, termination resistor, 120 ohm termination resistor to pin 6 and 14. Those are the two pins for the CAN uh, in every car built um, after, I think, 2007 was the first year that they, they uh, mandated CAN to be used on cars. Everybody, Every car now uses CAN. After 2006, 2007, some of the, of the uh, Europeans way back in 2002 were already using CAN. Uh, and as you can see, it actually... Uh, on the, in this in this next uh, view, it actually you can see the the, uh, the OBD2 connector in, in close up, where it actually uh, it, it injects power and ground through the uh, to the uh, pins number four and five and pins number uh, sixteen, and it also injects the CAN bus termination resistor and voltage uh, through pins uh, uh, six and fourteen. Uh, you can actually see all this stuff in the provided in the built-in uh, oscilloscope uh, this is a multiplex this is important for you to understand what it means it is a multiplex oscilloscope so as you can see on screen you actually choose your pin uh, by turning the little knob on the bottom uh, and pushing it that's how you actually navigate the unit and you can actually choose your pin or your test uh, uh, for, for this particular unit uh, and say you choose pins number six which is uh, the CAN pin, you'll be able to see on the oscilloscope pin number six instantaneously. On top of that, it'll, it'll uh, also assess whatever you're getting on pins number six, which should be around 2.6 volts, take or, you know, more, more or less, not exactly, but more or less. So, uh, and that's the CAN voltage. Uh, it'll assess it and give, give, uh, give you a, uh, a the, the, the value on the, um, on the, on the LCD screen, but you can also see it at the same time on the oscilloscope. So it's a built-in uh, scope with a bunch of uh, uh, automated testing right on the unit. But now that we're not going to go too deep on uh, the operation of this uh, unit now. Uh, that we're going to make another video, actually a bunch of videos for this particular unit. Uh, but this is the go-to tool uh, whenever you have an issue with sensors. Uh, where you get a bunch of codes for different sensors that probably means that your ECM ground is shot. Uh, when, you, when you get U codes, no communication code, this is the, the, the strong uh, part of, of this particular tool. This is not a scanner, it is simply an electronic breakout box for the OBD2 connector with built-in uh, tests uh, and a built-in multiplexer. And 
Hello everybody and welcome to another video. In today's video we are going to cover the power and ground testing uh, using the OBD2 uh, health checker. The OBD2 health checker as seen uh, on screen here, it's a unit that we uh, just introduced about two, three months ago and it's uh, geared uh, to test OBD2 connector issues, uh, uh, communications, power and ground and we just introduced a new feature on the menu uh, for testing uh, uh, alternator diodes. Now back to the video. In this particular video we are going to cover the uh, sensor uh, and chassis ground testing uh, that you find on the OBD2 health checker. Uh, this is very very important. Why is it important? Uh, because oftentimes your issue is not the sensor it's the it's, it's a, the ground you know and this is the best way that you can possibly rather than poking on, on the wires and and, and doing uh, 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 resistance uh, uh, voltage drops and resistance checking all over the, the car which would take you hours and hours and hours with the OBT2 health checker you can you can do it right away if you don't have a ground uh, on pin number uh, five which is sensor ground on the OBD2 connector, then you have an issue. And it's not only that, it doesn't, it, not only does it do a stress test on it, it actually does a bunch of other tests uh, a few times per second, hundreds of times per second that actually detect the issue. Uh, as you can see on screen, this is the menu for pin number five. Uh, actually the whole menu in there, very quick, we're gonna do the test in there, which will show you uh, a pass or fail score you know, on the uh, on the OBD2 health checker. Now, and this is important. How does the OBD2 health checker stress tests uh, your pins, uh, pins number four and five, and also it does pins number twelve. But we're only going to cover you know the chassis uh, in this particular uh, video. Uh, we may actually have a little bit of time and, and, and cover the, the pin number 12, which is a power feed. Anyhow, so it does have inside, uh, there's a series of relays and uh, resistors, which would actually uh, stress test. Besides other tests, it, it'll do other tests too on the ground. It'll inject a, uh, a tone signal through the... Uh, a high frequency tone signal through the through the wire, but we're not going to go into that because that's that's too complicated for this video. We'll do that a little, some other time. Anyhow, so it'll do a stress test uh, besides the other tests, and it'll as you can see on screen, uh, there is a, a relay inside. There's actually three relays on the on the unit that actually drop. Uh, they do a pressure, a stress, uh, a voltage drop test between uh, power and the ground. And it'll it'll uh, it'll uh, flow about two amps through pins number four and five. It'll do the same on twelve. Uh, but you know uh, this is sensor ground pins number five on the DLC connector, the data link connector. In this particular case, as you can see on screen, once the relay is activated uh, by the onboard computer on the DLC connector, the OBD2 DLC connector, you get you, you, the circuit closes and you get a flow of current. Uh, from ground right through pins uh, number four in this particular case. Uh, this actually stresses pins number four and everything after it. So whatever is connected to pins number four is going to flow. If you have an issue with uh, one of the grounds, the chassis ground, this particular case uh, pin number uh, four is chassis ground. If you have an issue with chassis ground, uh, you're going to see it and the unit is going to detect it and, uh, and it's going to also give you a pass or fail score. Uh, understand that there's also a bunch of other tests that are going on in this, um, you know, when you, when you do the test, but this is the main uh, feature of this particular test that it does, it stresses the, the pins. Now following, as you can see, we're going to do uh, the stress test on pins number five. Uh, now pin number five, again, it's the same deal. Uh, it actually stress tests pin number four. Pin, pin number five is even more important than pin number four because it's sensor ground. Now pin number five, uh, basically, it's going the same deal. It's going to flow about two amps right through the uh, uh, right through the pin and every circuit after that, and it'll it'll give you a pass or fail score. Uh, this is a very easy feature to use uh, by just connecting to the OBD2 connector. Uh, the DLC health checker has a bunch of other features uh, 
uh, that we're going to, that we have on, on different videos that we you know that we 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 we've posted here on this channel and on our website. Anyhow, so uh, so this is the issue. Uh, the issue with pin number five is that oftentimes it it has a faulty ground, which is sensor ground. It feeds all this, the sensors on your uh, uh, on your vehicle and if you have an issue with the sensor ground you have a tremendous issue oftentimes what you're going to have you are going to have a bunch of codes uh, and then that's pretty much the issue uh, it's not the sensors it's, it's the ground and finally we're going to cover the uh, 12 volt pin number 16 uh, stress test again uh, this is the same as the other two tests but it's different because it it doesn't take pin number 16 to power because it's already power it takes it to ground so there are internal circuitry inside uh, that also it'll do a frequency test in, inside there which is a test that you do um, to ascertain the battery and, and a bunch of other things you know and it also then it does the stress test uh, again uh, this test is it's done uh, differently uh, it, it takes the pin number 16 to ground as you can see through uh, a, a resistance a very very small resistor which actually stresses it, it does the same thing it'll draw about two amps uh, through pin number 16 pin number 16 is important because it has to do with the power feed for the computer uh, there's more tests that you have to do in order to ascertain that the computer is getting proper power there's also a test in here for the uh, alternator diode which we uh, recently introduced uh, again uh, this is uh, uh, these tests are important and as you can see on screen it'll draw it'll close the uh, the relay there's an internal relay that actually uh, puts a um, resistor in uh, it'll take a resistor to ground on the other side to pin number 16 and basically it draws uh, two amps right through pin number 16 and every circuit after it which is really what you're looking for. Pin number 16 is fed usually through a relay, the main relay on the computer, but there's also wiring and a bunch of other connectors and stuff in, in between, and this is what you're gonna be testing. Uh, so uh, again, this is all important, and don't forget, we're gonna do another video on the, uh, on the alternator diode test, which uh, took us quite a while to finish uh, but we actually did it and we uh, released it uh, we're releasing it in the new units uh, right now uh, that feature in there uh, anyhow so uh, updates for the obd2 health checker is are free uh, whatever you however many uh, updates we put out are going to be free of charge uh, so we don't charge for uh, for updates uh, so again we'd like to thank everybody for tuning into our channel uh, adp training uh, and uh, we actually uh, uh, push you to uh, visit our website autodiagnosticsandpublishing.com uh, and um, uh, you know, on screen you see uh, we're going to go th cover go through all the tests that we just covered in this video uh, and again uh, we appreciate you tuning into our channel and thank you for watching Welcome to ADP Training, YouTube's automotive technology channel. In this channel, you'll learn all kinds of auto repair secrets, how your automobile works, and how to diagnose it. Hello everybody and welcome to another video. In today's video, we are going to uh, uh, talk about testing the CAN bus using the OBD2 Health Checker. Uh, the OBD2 Health Checker is our, our newest tool uh, design it's uh, it's a multiplexer for the OBD2 connector pretty much uh, now uh, as you can see on screen uh, this is what the CAN network uh, signal should look like okay so you have the CAN high and the CAN low the CAN high is in green and the CAN low is in uh, like white or yellow uh, depending on your uh, on your monitor uh, now this these are the voltages more or less uh, that you should have. The, the reason I say more or less is, is because it's not 
uh, a set, it's not set in stone when it comes to the OBD2 uh, CAN protocol. CAN in, in general uh, does not dictate to the letter uh, the voltage values. Uh, but in cars, in automobiles, it's, this is pretty much standard. Okay, you have about 2.6 volts, in, in the, that's the midpoint that you see there, and then from there, the CAN low triggers low and the CAN high triggers high. Basically, the OBD2 uh, health DLC health checker, uh, it's a unit that has an embedded, it also has an embedded oscilloscope in it. Uh, today, we're going to study how to uh, test the CAN network. And this is, this is very important for all these U codes. On screen now, you see, as you can see, a diagram of the unit, you know, itself. Uh, and basically, what it is, it's uh, the OBD2 connector is linked uh, through the uh, DLC uh, health checker um, to all the pins through a multiplexer inside. Now, for for CAN, there's only two pins that we are concerned with. Okay, which is uh, pins number 6 and 14. But now, uh, there's uh, other things for the OBD2 health checker that are important. And when it comes to Kenway, which is power and ground testing and all, and all these things. But we're not going to cover that in this video. Uh, basically, what it is, is that it also has a 120 ohm uh, termination resistor built in inside the unit if you want. There's a switch on the top that you use for that. Uh, so say, for example, you have no 120 ohm termination resistor, you're not going to have CAN, okay, and, and voltage uh, on the CAN. You flip that switch and it'll, it'll give you a CAN and at least you'll be able to communicate and determine that that is your problem. There's two 120, 120 ohm termination resistors, which uh, it, it comes up to 60 ohms because they're in parallel with each other. Okay, so two 120 ohm resistors in parallel it equals 60 ohms. That's what CAN needs to communicate. It can, it can work without one resistor, which will be make it 120 ohm termination. It'll work with that. That's why you, they put two resistors in there in case one fails. Uh, and so basically that's what that's. But our unit actually looks at pins number uh, 6 and 14. It also, uh, you can actually substitute and uh, inject voltage and the resistor in there if need be. Uh, now, uh, again, on screen now, you can see the signal, uh, which this is this was taken with one of our um, uh, um, uh, oscilloscopes. It's, it wasn't taken with, but it's just for sake of explaining the voltage values in there. Okay, so basically this is what you're supposed to see. You're not going to see them together because the OBD2 health checker has a single channel multiplexer in there and there's no really no reason to, to check both of them at the same time. Basically, if you, uh, the unit, you don't have to poke into the wires, everything is, you can do everything just with one button in there. And now, as you can see on screen, uh, this is, uh, and we just wanted to show you this. This is how, how the OBD2 health checker is going to behave if you're not connected to the battery properly, okay? It'll just click on and off, on and off, on and off, as you can see on screen. Uh, basically, it's letting you know that there's not sufficient voltage to run the unit. Uh, and at, at that point in time, make sure you look at your connections to the battery because the unit has to be referenced at the battery. It's not that it takes power that from the battery, which it is, but it has to be referenced more than any, anything else. It's gonna com compare the voltage uh, to the battery, which is that's what it means reference. Now, going back to the functioning of this particular unit and testing uh, the DLC uh, pins number 6 and 14, uh, as you can see, we are actually, we power the unit, it goes through a check, and you can see all, here all the, the, the relays clicking in, inside there. And basically all you have to do is just turn that knob and go into pin number 6, Go, of course, you're going to go in with your scanner. There is a Y connector that uh, comes with a unit where you can plug in your scanner together with the OBD2 uh, DLC health checker. Uh, and as you can see, we are actually uh, going into the CAN uh, system. This was actually a Ford vehicle. Uh, anything after 2006 has to be CAN. So it's going to be CAN if it's 2006 or newer. Okay, and as you can see on screen, uh, the voltage where we're checking, this is uh, pin number six, <coughs> which uh, 
Pin number six is scan high. That's why you see 3.8 volts because you're switching. That's the upper side. Remember, the, the viewing, the LCD is going to give you a snapshot, you know, of the, um, of the voltage. And as you can see, uh, we are basically graphing uh, with, the, with the scanner. So we're communicating uh, back and forth. And you can actually see pin number six. And we're also going to show you pin number 14. Uh, on the oscilloscope, the built-in oscilloscope in there. Uh, remember that the scope is going to, you can make all kinds of uh, measurements in there uh, because it gives you, if you look at the, the scope, it has uh, texting. It has the, that text on the top that actually measures the minimum and maximum and this and that. And you'll be able to go through all your, uh, your measurements in there. And basically, this, this is, I mean, this is 100%. Uh, and if you, what we're doing right now is we're expanding the time base and you can actually see the single pulses uh, for each can um, uh, network. So each one of those pulses are either 0 or 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, or 0, 0, 0, whatever, you know, uh, basically. So that's, uh, that's how the, the unit communicates. It toggles between 2.6 and in this particular case, the upper side will be 3.6 more or less. Remember, it's not always the same on every car. It could be 3.8. Uh, it could be even a little higher than that, uh, depending on the vehicle that you're working on, because CAN doesn't really specify 100% the value, the voltage values. But that's more or less what you're going to see uh, right here. And so uh, that's pretty much it. You know, so you don't have to do anything. All you got to do is go in, uh, graph your 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 pins, uh, connect with the scanner, and see if you have a connection. If you don't have communication, if you don't see the signal on the scope side and you don't see anything, uh, you know, when you connect the scanner, basically you have a problem. So you, there, are, there are things that you could do. Uh, you can actually go uh, and switch the unit, uh, the, the switch on the top, which actually injects uh, 120 ohm resistor and voltage into the, into the, into the uh, uh, CAN network and then go from there. Uh, so it's basically, you know, uh, it's a done deal. This, this is a, a turnkey operation. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to poke in with a, with a scope. You don't have to buy a scope. You don't have to do anything. If you have a scope, which I highly recommend, it's nice. Uh, but it's still, you know, you would have to go into the wire, to the wires in the back and poke into the wires and this and that. Uh, the second thing that you should do when it comes to CAN uh, vehicles it's, you're going to have to, if it doesn't communicate, one of the modules is shorted. And then you would have to start disconnecting modules. Here on screen, you can see the, a gateway in the, in the, uh, in the diagram. If, uh, if the module, if the, if the vehicle has a gateway, and this is now common on the Durangos, the new Durangos, there is a connector that you have to uh, buy, purchase, and this is only for the Durango. Uh, where you uh, disconnect the gateway, you connect this connector, and it actually the bypasses the gateway uh, because the gateway is the one on these Durangos, and that, I'm sure they're going to do it on other cars too. Let's see how that works out. Uh, whereby you know the the gateway is the one is the one that actually authorizes the modules, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's the same principle. You're still going to need the CAN to communicate with intermodule uh, networks, you know, with the gateway. Uh, so basically, uh, you're going to have to get a l that little connector. It's not too expensive, uh, and basically, you still need uh, the DLC health ch checker uh, uh, to communicate uh, to find out the faults. Uh, in this case, now we on screen. It's again what we've explained before. Once you connect, if you're missing the 120 volt, uh, 120 ohm uh, resistors, uh, you still you're going to see uh, about 2.5, 2.6 volts. Uh, when the, when the network is not communicating. That's what you're going to see. Like if you don't see that, then there's something wrong. And that's what, you know, our unit pretty much uh, injects voltage and those termination resistors. Uh, in this case, you need at least 60 ohms in there. That's usually what you need. But 120 ohm is what we inject into the, uh, um, you, we actually connect that in parallel with, with, the, with the CAN network and you need that to communicate. Okay, so it'll at least have communication, you know, uh, with the network. Again, we would like to thank you for tuning in to our channel, ADP Training, and our website, autodiagnosticsandpublishing.com. Uh, see what it's all about if you want to find out more about the OBD2 Health, uh, health Checker. 
And uh, basically, we'd like to thank you for tuning in, as you always do. Leave comments, uh, leave us a thumbs up or thumbs down, whatever you, whatever you, you think we're worth, you know. And uh, at the end of the, of the video, you're going to see an AQR code. All you got to do is scan it uh, with the PayPal app. And basically, you can donate anything that you want to, to, uh, to our channel here, which is free. We don't charge for this channel. Okay, so thank you for tuning in and thank you for watching. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another video. In today's video, we are going to uh, talk about the uh, automotive CAN bus uh, voltage testing. And we're also going to explain how and how the, the, the voltage that you see at any CAN vehicle, how, these, uh, uh, how you arrive at these voltages. Um, and there's, um, there's a lot behind it. So anyhow, bear with us. But first, a few basics. This is the basic OBD2 uh, DLC uh, data link connector on any automotive, uh, on any automobile um, uh, made um, after 1996. Um, in this particular case, almost everything nowadays after nine, everything became CAN uh, controller area network, which was uh, was developed originally by Bosch. Uh, so now, pin number six and fourteen are the ones that are going to carry the signal. Now these are the pins mandated by law. Uh, they all have, have has to have a pin number six and fourteen running CAN. Uh, they may, uh, for example, the slow, there's a slow CAN and there's different variations of CAN uh, that run on pins number one, for example, and this, this, and that. We're not going to talk about that. We're just going to concentrate uh, on CAN vehicles controlling area network as it is mandated by OBD2. As you've been seeing on screen, uh, this is the OBD2 health meter. Uh, it is a uh, dedicated unit that we actually manufactured and designed and developed, which just introduces in, into the market. Uh, so it's uh, very handy when it comes to uh, OBD2 diagnostics, uh, running, uh, testing power and grounds and, and so on and, forth, uh, and so forth. Uh, the, the video is not necessarily about this unit, but it's just you know basically we uh, some of the stuff that you see on this uh, on this video were actually captured or enforced by the uh, uh, the OBD2 health meter very quickly as you can see on screen uh, this unit it's loaded with a bunch of uh, electronics inside that actually stress um, the power the DLC power the chassis ground the sensor ground the pin number 16 uh, power um, oftentimes you have issues with that and that on the, on the sensors and the set the grounds and you you really don't know unless you actually test them and they're causing all kinds of problems on your uh, on your uh, readings uh, uh, for the for the scanner and it's not there's nothing wrong with anything it's just that you have a, 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 a faulty ground or, or power so the unit has these big resistors uh, on top as you see on screen um, on, in yellow uh, there are 20 ohm resistors that I, the unit actually shorts the ground and the power uh, and it actually um, uh, measures you know there's a computer inside that actually measures the, and there's a screen as you saw uh, uh, as you actually can see on screen right now um, anyhow and there's uh, there's also other stuff in there too you can actually substitute the 60 ohm termination resistors with this unit uh, it actually injects a voltage also uh, on the can uh, signal in case you're missing it uh, there's a bunch of stuff you know that that you can actually do with this unit uh, and that it, it actually if it, you need to understand about can vehicles and, and how it, it is structured and that we're going to talk about that here as you can see on screen this is what a uh, a can network uh, has to uh, has to look like they're all the same the only thing that, that that changes is the amount of modules and this is a simple can where you see the instrument cluster the uh, transmission control module the acm um, uh, th there's also the uh, ABS uh, module in there and as you can see you have you have to have two termination resistors and this is this is basic when it comes to uh, to CAN networks uh, between the two termination resistors if you if you have two resistors in parallel as you see on screen on this diagram you're going to have 60 ohms if you measure the uh, the two pins pins number 6 and 14 you're going to have 60 ohms and that's exactly give or take a couple of ohms 
usually 60, uh, 62, 63, 58, something like that. Doesn't have to be exact, but close. Uh, so basically, you're gonna once you have two 120 ohm uh, um, resistors in parallel, you're gonna have 60 ohms across both um, uh, wires, you know, on, on the can. And these are usually twisted pair. Uh, wires, they're, they're twisted, and this is to prevent uh, EMF uh, e e electromagnetic interference. Now, it is important that these uh, 120 ohm resistors, you may lose one of them, and depending on the vehicle, it may or may not operate. Uh, but you need to find where these, and this is usually the instrument cluster is the one, is one of them that almost always has the one one of the 120 ohm termination resistors. The ACM normally carries the, the other 120 ohm resistor. Now, if you lose these resistors, oftentimes you have no communication. And if you measure across these two wires, basically pins number six and, and, uh, and 14, you're not gonna see 60 ohms. You're gonna see, you might see 120 ohms or you might see infinite. That means you lost both resistors. Or you may see zero. That means you're shorted. That means the uh, CAN network is shorted. Uh, the two wires are shorted. Then you're not going to have communication. In our video here, we're going to initiate communication. We're going to show you what it looks like on an oscilloscope. And this is probably the best way to do it. Now, uh, but before we go into that, basically um, uh, the unit, as you can see on this particular diagram, uh, the OBD2 connector has gives you access uh, this is the easiest way to give you access to these two pins, pins number 6 and 14, okay? Uh, our unit, uh, the uh, OBD2 DLC health meter, actually goes in there and plugs into uh, um, power and ground on pins number uh, um, 16, which is power, uh, 4, uh, 5, and, and that's it. That's how you power the unit. I don't know, 4, 6, and 14 for the CANT network. Uh, the unit then substitutes a bunch of depending on the tests that you actually pick on your on screen it's got the it has a little screen a uh, touch screen in, in there and you you actually choose either the automated test and it actually runs the, the all the testing in there uh, or you can actually p uh, pick and choose uh, which test you actually want it has a um, like an oscilloscope but it's not an oscilloscope it's more of a uh, uh, graphing multimeter where you can actually see what we're going to see now we're going to see that later on in, the, in this video uh, you can actually see the the, the signals uh, and you'll know right away and the unit is also going to analyze the signal for you this is what's different about this unit than anything else that you you, you can plug in anything you want like an oscilloscope and this and that and if you don't, don't know exactly what to look for which we're going to show you here anyways uh, but some of you may not really be into it, you know, and you still have a car with no communication. So what are you going to do? So this unit, it's automated and it, it goes into uh, a bunch of tests that you don't even know that it's doing it. And it, it's pretty much, in a, it'll tell you, you know, if you have an issue. Now on screen, let's start by analyzing the signal that you're going to see either on the unit, on the OBD2, uh, OBD2 um, DLC health meter or on an oscilloscope. In this particular case, we uh, are going to use an oscilloscope because the screen is bigger and we can actually show you a, in a better format. Um, basically, what we did, and you're going to see later on in the video, you're going to see that we actually made a virtual CAN network. Uh, and this is what we're doing right now. But anyhow, what you see right now, it's a, uh, th this is the CAN signal for both wires, okay? The yellow one is for the can low, and the green one is for the can high. Now, very carefully, let's look at the screen uh, as you see it right now on this, on this particular diagram. If you were to measure with, a, with an uh, ohmmeter uh, the resistance between the two uh, wires, okay? Not the resistance, I'm sorry, the, uh, the voltage with the, uh, with the vehicle key on, engine off, uh, Basically, what you would see between the two uh, CAN wires, CAN low and CAN high, pins number uh, 6 and 14, you're going to see zero volts. Okay, this is important because everybody gets confused when they see it. They say, well, I have zero volts, I have no, com so I have no communication, zero volts, something's wrong. No, you're, you're supposed to see zero volts. In the, uh, in the old days, back in the 70s and 80s, uh, sometimes we used to install radios, car radios, 
uh, which had a floating grounds. The speakers had floating grounds. There, there was no gr the ground for the speakers was not the same as the vehicle ground. And so they were, you know, finicky, you know, back then. People would not understand that. And so basically this is what it is. Uh, a can system has a floating ground. So the ground has nothing to do with the, uh, with the battery ground. So if you measure, measure across the uh, can high and can low, pins number 6 and 14, you, it's going to be 0 volt. Now, uh, if, on the other hand, you measure, and as you see now, we, ch we change the diagram, uh, between ground, the actual gr uh, um, chassis ground, which is it would be pin uh, pin number f um, chassis ground would be pin number four. Um, if you measure between chassis ground and one of the uh, and one of the wires, uh, either the can low or the can high, you're going to see 2.5 volts. Okay, so now going back to the uh, and this is basically what. Uh, the CAN uh, protocol calls, uh, calls for. You have to have 2.5 volts between chassis ground and uh, either CAN low or CAN high. Now because both wires are the same uh, voltage potential between them, you see zero. Okay? Now, um, we're going to see on screen right now, this is, this is the, going back to the CAN bus, bus signal. Uh, basically this signal the yellow one is the can low and the uh, and the green one the green half of it is the can high this is actually channels one and two of the scope uh which you actually you know if you go into with the, with the unit that we have the uh obd2 health meter you're going to see exactly the same uh, so basically you're going to see um the can low and the can high uh it's not really superimposed because they don't switch at the same level uh, the can low is going to go between 2.5 and 1.5. We're going to see later on when I explain that. And the can high is going to switch between 2.5 and uh, and 3.5. Between the two, uh, can low and can high, you have to have two volts. Okay. So as you see, as you can see on screen right now, the can high, uh, and this is basically the, what the signal says. Uh, the can high is at 3.43. On the high side, 2.5 on the basically on the um, uh, on the resting side, and uh, one point the, the low can low is 1.43 uh, on the low side, and again 2.5 on the resting side. This is called uh, the dominant and recessive. Okay, recessive will be the 2.5 for both signals, which is always at 2.5. In this particular case, it's actually 2.43, but this is doesn't have to be exact, but, but very close, okay? This is called recessive because it's always resting. If the can is not communicating, uh, basically you're going to have 2.5 volts, okay? This is uh, recessive. The, the dominant is when it actually switches either low or high. In this particular case, the can low is going to go to one point. Uh, 43 in this in this case you know or 2.43 uh, I'm, I'm sorry 3.43 on the on the can high which is the green side between the the difference between both can low and can high when it's switching has to be two volts otherwise the uh, obd2 the, the the can protocol it's not going to work okay and this is uh this last uh, uh, diagram actually the the snapshot that we have here it, it actually shows you that. It, it says, you know, between the high side and the low side on both signals taken together, this is called the delta, uh, which is a delta means difference. It's a Greek letter, which actually means uh, the difference between the two signals has to be two volts. You really don't care much about taking the difference between the, the, the two sides um, because it's ac you're actually going to see it, you know, like you see it right now when you put a scope in, the, in there either our unit or, or an actual oscilloscope. Uh, so basically, uh, you know, and you have to be careful too because sometimes, depending on the scope that you're using, sometimes the, uh, the actual scope ground is going to ground the signal. So be careful on how you do it. Otherwise, you're going to go nuts, you know, if you really don't know what you're doing. It's not, not going to damage anything, uh, but you're not going to see anything on, on screen and then you're going to go crazy. Anyhow, so again, remember that the voltage between uh, the, the center voltage, uh, which is, that's, that's called the recessive 
uh, CAN signal is always going to be 2.5 volts when taken between the chassis ground and the actual signal itself, uh, or which is uh, the recessive is going to be 2.5, and the dominant is either going to be on the low side, it's going to be uh, um, uh, 1.43, in this particular case, 1.4. So basically, you, in this particular example, we are 2.4 on the on the on the uh, recessive, supposed to be theoretically 2.5. So basically, theoretically, 2.5 on the recessive, which is the center, as you see it here, uh, and the uh, and the dominant on the low side on the can low is going to be 1.5. The can high is going to be 3.5. Okay, this is really the theoretical behind the can protocol. Uh, so between the two, you have to have, as you see here, two p two volts difference between the can low and the can high. Otherwise, uh, the can uh, uh, chips, you know, the uh, the microprocessor in inside that actually detect the signal, is they're not going to be they're not going to detect the signal. And this is how you have to look at it. Otherwise, then you you could have, for example, a recessive of 2.5 or 2.4, more or less, but then it's not switching all the way. The on the low side, the can low is not going to, it's not switching. Maybe it'll give you um, uh, two volts, okay, when it switches low. And the can high is going to give you three volts, not three point, not three point five as you see here. Then you know you have an issue. You could have resistance in the wires, uh, which is usually the case in one of the mo the nodes, one of the modules. Uh, for whatever reason, you know, maybe the, there's a lot of humidity where the vehicle is being driven and this, this and that, and who knows, okay? But definitely you can't have that. You have to have between the two signals, two volts difference. Otherwise, the signal is not going to get recognized pretty much. <coughs> now, as you can see on screen, we actually have a virtual network that we created uh, with these uh, gadgets that we have. They actually, th these are actually can uh, uh, transceivers that we have here, um, which we uh, we do a lot of experimentation with these guys. Now, what we did is we, we took an OBD2 connector and we rigged power and ground to it to uh, be able to power the, uh, the the little scanner that we have that we're going to use for testing. And then we the the yellow uh, wires that you see it's actually pins number six and fourteen for the CAN network. Okay, now. Uh, some of you have the idea that if the vehicle has a, uh, and we're really going to go into this very briefly right now, if the vehicle has a gateway that uh, all of a sudden everything is lost and there's nothing you could do, that's not the case. Okay, so in, um, as you can see, we're briefly we're going to explain this. We're going to do another video on gateways. So anyhow, a gateway is a, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, a module that actually uh, inter interconnects different modules together uh, with the ECM and with the DLC connector. Okay, so the gateway, it's uh, basically, it's uh, some, like a gatekeeper. That's why it's called a gateway. And so all the modules are connected to the gateway and the gateway decides who has the access to the gateway. Okay, uh, whoever has the access to the gateway has access to the other modules. That's not so in every single vehicle out there right now. They're starting to do that right now as we speak. Uh, this is the year 2019. Uh, anyhow, so uh, so basically a gateway is a gatekeeper for the different modules. And what it does is it actually uh, interconnects different speed modules. So you have the, the seat belt, uh, the seat, not the seat belt, the seat module, which is very slow. It doesn't have to be fast, so it's very inexpensive module. Uh, that actually needs to co needs to connect with the ECM and everybody else. Uh, you you don't want to have it in the same uh, signal. The everybody thinks that this is because of security and this and that. It's nothing to do with security because you can actually bypass the gateway very easily, as we're gonna we're gonna explain. So basically, what you do if you want to have access to the CAN network, you you're gonna have to remove the gateway and connect to the two uh, CAN uh, wires, the the CAN low and the CAN high. Um, uh, on the other side of the gateway, as you can see on screen right now. So the gateway, you know, restricts ac access to the other module unless you have the right scanner. Uh, but you don't, you know, like for example, on uh, Chrysler vehicles, you remove the gateway, which is right behind the radio. Uh, and basically you have access to, to, the, to the one wire, you know, the, the, the cam uh, signal wires. 
the can low and the can high. And once you have access to those, then you can actually access whatever module uh, you want. That's if you have the scanner that actually communicates with the gate. But if you just want to see that, you know, that the network is running properly, uh, you can act, you actually you could do that manually by going to into the into the wires. This may not be necessary uh, on on the vehicle that you're working on, but just uh, trying to explain to you that the gate. Once you remove the gate, put the gateway out of, of out of the the picture, then you actually have access to the to the CAN wire, and you can actually do whatever you want. If you want to connect the scanner to it, fine. If you just want to see if you have the termination resistors, which is really what we're talking about here, uh, that's what what this video is really for. And then you, you can actually do that. Uh, on the other side of the gateway. If you know that you have the termination resistors fine and the signals, the signaling, it's okay, uh, then basically, once you know that, then your problem is, it's uh, whatever problem with the specific module uh, that you're trying to communicate with, uh, not necessarily a problem with the CAN network, uh, which is, again, this is the purpose of this video, is to make sure that the actual physical um, uh, the, the physicality of the of the network it is there and basically you you're looking for the termination resistor it has to have two uh, regardless you know and uh, in this particular case if you have a gateway you, as you can see on screen you have interconnections between uh, uh, these guys they we have actually three uh, three networks uh, on screen right now the one with the ABS is one network which has the ABS, the cluster, the TCM, and then the and, and the other modules. And then you have the other one which has a seat, module 5, 14, 11, module 10, and 4. That's another network. They're all interconnected to the gateway. And each one has to have a, a termination resistor of 120 ohm. Uh, and the two of the, in this particular case, for example, the, the module, the network that has the ABS on it, uh, you're going to have a termination resistor on the gateway itself, and you're going to have a terminate not necessarily, but usually it does, and then another termination resistor, uh, for example, module 3, uh, the, which is all the way at the end. It could be in any of, the, of those modules, and you have to find out which one it is if you don't have that termination. If you measure between those two and that particular network, if you measure between the two wires, the can low and the can high, you don't see 60 ohms. Remember, it's 120 ohms, but you have to have two of these, okay, and that between the both of them, it's a, it's a, it's a 60, um, 60 ohm, but each one is 120 ohm resistor. So where is it? That's up to you to find out. And some, most oftentimes it's not easy, okay? And this is the issues with uh, when uh, uh, diagnosing problems with the, with the uh, communication with the CAN. As you can see on screen, uh, this is live. This is actually the, the scanner trying to establish communication. We're not necessarily connected. The, the virtual network that we have will give you the voltage levels and will give, give you the termination resistors, but it's not. You're not going to see anything because we're not dealing with uh, we're dealing with a CAN network. We're, we're not really connected to a car, and we really don't care. Even if you're doing uh, um, diagnostics on a regular vehicle, you're not you're not going to look at uh, see you know watch these uh, pulses in there and say, well, that pulse is for the ABS. I recognize that, but you'll never be able to recognize that pulse. You need a, a network analyzer for that, and it's really, you don't really need that. You don't really care what the pulses are. The, for that, you use a scanner, and you try and establish communication. If you don't have, if you have a problem with the, I don't know, for example, the uh, ABS module, okay? And the ABS module, it could be uh, the seat belt module, the, the, or the seat module, the, 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 power, you know, the power window module, whatever. And you basically, you you have no community. You try and establish communication with the uh, with a module that that's that's not communicating. And usually, what you have is you're going to have co uh, faulty codes uh, uh, on the on the other modules. Uh, no communication with the uh, ABS module, for example. And everybody else is going to have no communication with the ABS module. So if you look at the TCM, the transmission, you look at the ECM, you look at the everybody else, no communication with the ABS module. So the ABS module is not communicating. So you look at the network, where, what it's uh, connected to, uh, and if you, if you definitely have uh, the terminations in, in there, the 60 ohms between the two, the can low and the can high, and you have the voltage, 2.5 volts, between ground and e either either one of the uh, of the can okay, the, the can low and the can high, then you have your physicality is there. That basically what you have to do then is find out why you don't have communication with the ABS module. It could be the ABS module itself is shot, 
Uh, it could be the uh, the wires are, are one of the wires is um, cut, you know, uh, somehow broken, uh, and you have no communication or whatever, you know. Uh, but you deal with it. Then you know that your your problem is not necessarily uh, a, a broad problem with the uh, with the can. If you have no uh, no 60 ohms between the two cables between the two wires, can low and can high, then you have to start tracking why. And in which case you're not going to have communication with a bunch of the modules. Going back into the uh, the uh, gateway that you saw before, uh, you're gonna then you have to find out, you know, how many networks do you have? Because you could have three, you could have two or three networks, and each each network is going to have a, a specific uh, um, bunch of different modules, and you have to find the modules that you're trying to establish communication with and find out why you don't have communication. Usually, if it's a broad problem, you're going to have no communication with all the modules on that particular, uh, and sometimes the gateway itself is shot. W and it actually has communication with the other modules, but not with the network that, that's uh, defective. You have to find all these problems. Basically, with what you've learned in this video, uh, you can actually do that. It is possible for you to do that. It's going to require you know, some disassembly on your end, uh, trying to uh, uh, s you know, see which, you know, where, where to find the gateway and where to, where to do this, this and that. And oftentimes, you know, the, you do have a gateway module which, uh, that does not restrict communication uh, to the scanner. So again, it's, uh, there are variations of, of this, of what we're talking about in this video. But the basic uh, knowledge that you're, gonna, that you're gaining right now with this video is going to help you uh, fix almost any, any problem uh, that's related to the network, you know, to uh, CAN networks, you know. Uh, and again, you know, we, uh, um, you know, if you have the unit that we have, it's actually, it's handy because it, it does a bunch of stuff, you know, that, that usually you have to do it manually. It's not that you need our unit, but it's, it's a good thing to have. Uh, and basically, that this is what we do in this video so that you actually learn to analyze the, uh, uh, and, uh, and pinpoint the, uh, certain factors you know like uh, resistance between the cables and this and that termination resistors uh the whether you have a gateway or not which uh, how many uh, networks do you have how many modules what's connected to what and so on and so forth anyhow uh, we'd like to thank you for tuning into our channel adp training uh, we suggest that you subscribe to our, ch our channel if you like it or uh, to our website automotive diagnostics and publishing it's actually autodiagnosticsandpublishing.com uh, you can find us on uh, on, um, on uh, Facebook you can find us uh, uh, at autodiagnosticsandpublishing.com that's our Facebook page uh, or on, on Instagram um, ADP training uh, backslash or under underscore uh, YouTube which is ADP training it's our YouTube channel okay which is basically you know anything that's automotive on the high-end side, we go into the complicated issues, you know, with uh, um, uh, with our automotive technology. This is it. Okay. So anyhow, we'd like to thank you for tuning in uh, to our channel, ADP Training, and thank you for watching. Fuel trims is a calculated PID and is usually expressed in percentage. The fuel trim is the calculated value of the adjustments performed by the ECM to the base injector pulse. The fuel trim PID is always divided into long-term fuel trims and short-term fuel trims. The long-term fuel trims are the long-term adjustments performed by the ECM to the base injector pulse. This parameter is an indication of the ECM response to more persistent and influential air fuel ratio faults such as a large vacuum leak or a punctured fuel pressure regulator. Also, the long-term fuel trims only changes value after the short-term fuel trims has reached its maximum limit and the ECM can no longer adjust the mixture. The long-term fuel trims can be thought of as a slow-acting parameter that only intervenes when its partner, the short-term fuel trims, can no longer correct the mixture. The short-term fuel trims are the short-term adjustments performed by the ECM to the base injector pulse. This PID reacts very fast to changes in the air-fuel ratio. The ECM will always try and keep the short-term fuel trims as close to 0.00% as possible, so long as it can maintain a stoichiometric air-fuel ratio 
Through smaller corrections to the injector pulse, the short-term fuel trims will hover at a maximum value of positive or negative 10%. In the event that a greater air fuel ratio fault exists, the ACM will not be able to correct the problem through smaller corrections, and the long term fuel trims will increase, thereby taking the short term fuel trims back to close to 0.00% again. So the fuel trim PID is not an actual component. It is just a measure of how far the ECM is changing the injector pulse to compensate for the different conditions. Any time the fuel trims go above or below plus or minus 10%, there is a problem. Above 10%, there is a lean condition. Below minus 10%, there is a rich condition. Fuel trims is a calculated PID and is usually expressed in percentage. The fuel trim is the calculated value of the adjustments performed by the ECM to the base injector pulse the fuel trim PID is always divided into long-term fuel trims and short-term fuel trims. The long-term fuel trims are the long-term adjustments performed by the ECM to the base injector pulse. This parameter is an indication of the ECM response to more persistent and influential air fuel ratio faults, such as a large vacuum leak or a punctured fuel pressure regulator. Also, the long-term fuel trims only changes value after the short-term fuel trims has reached its maximum limit and the ECM can no longer adjust the mixture. The long-term fuel trims can be thought of as a slow-acting parameter that only intervenes when its partner, the short-term fuel trims, can no longer correct the mixture. The short-term fuel trims are the short-term adjustments performed by the ECM to the base injector pulse. This PID reacts very fast to changes in the air-fuel ratio. The ACM will always try and keep the short-term fuel trims as close to 0.00% as possible. So long as it can maintain a stoichiometric air-fuel ratio, through smaller corrections to the injector pulse, the short-term fuel trims will hover at a maximum value of plus or minus 10%. In the event that a greater air fuel ratio fault exists, the ACM will not be able to correct the problem through smaller corrections and the long term fuel trims will increase, thereby taking the short term fuel trims close to 0.0% again. About 60% of all check engine light faults are air fuel related. General Motors was the first manufacturer to put out a fuel trim PID. As far back as 1981, GM vehicles were using fuel trim values, which they called block learn, for the long-term fuel trims, and integrator, for the short-term fuel trims. Older GM vehicles use the lower scale on the chart, which puts 14.7 to 1 air fuel ratio, at 128, which equals OVD to 0.00%. This older fuel trim scale can still be found today, as a GM scanner PID thereby complementing the newer OVD2 generic scale. So remember, if your fuel trims are over plus 10%, then the ECM is adding injector pulse time due to a lean condition. Such as a broken intake gasket or O-ring, punctured brake booster, faulty vacuum hose, faulty mass air flow sensor, or even a broken intake air duct on a mass air flow system. A lean condition is by far the most common. On the other hand, if the fuel trims are minus 10%, then the ECM is subtracting injector pulse time due to a rich condition. Such as a stuck open EGR valve, punctured fuel pressure regulator, leaky injector, or even a blown head gasket, which is burning the antifreeze alcohol content, making a rich mixture. In resume, positive over plus 10% fuel trims equals a lean condition and negative under minus 10% fuel trims equals a rich condition. The fuel rail pressure PID. With the electronic return less fuel system, the ACM relies on the fuel rail pressure or FRP sensor for fuel pressure input right at the fuel injectors. By monitoring the fuel pressure, the ECM can then adjust the fuel pump's rotational speed and maintain a stable pressure. Once a stable fuel pressure is attained, the formation of fuel vapors in the fuel line itself is greatly reduced. The whole process happens very fast since it is electronically controlled. The fuel rail pressure sensor is a three-wire piezoelectric electronic pressure sensor. 
This means that the sensor's resistance varies as pressure changes. The fuel rail pressure sensor is also connected in line with an internal ECM voltage divider resistor network. In some fuel rail pressure sensor applications, the sensor is also connected to the intake manifold vacuum side. In this arrangement the sensor's signal output is a differential signal of fuel pressure to intake manifold which the ECM uses to control the fuel pump speed. Therefore, maintaining the fuel in the rail in liquid state and preventing fuel vapors. The differential signal of the FRP sensor takes into consideration the amount of intake manifold vacuum of the engine. This way the ECM can properly control the actual amount of fuel leaving the injectors. As a rule, the 0.55 volts signal corresponds to zero pressure and 4.6 volts corresponds to about 70 psi. When analyzing this PID, make sure the small vacuum hose is connected. The fuel status is a calculated value and indicates whether the ECM is in closed or open loop. Open loop means that the ECM looks at the O2 sensor, makes the specific corrections to the fuel pulse, the O2 sensor reacts, the ECM again reads the O2 sensor and readjusts the mixture. Since the relationship is between the O2 sensor and the ECM and back to the O2 sensor, hence the PID parameter it name closed loop. When this PID is in closed loop the ECM is in full control of the mixture. If this PID is in open loop the ECM has tried to adjust the mixture all the way to its maximum and has failed. A system in open loop means that the ECM is operating in limpin mode, which means that the injection pulse and ignition timing are fixed to allow the driver to reach the nearest repair shop. This is a very important PID. The fuel status is always open loop when the engine is cold. Do not try to analyze this PID with a cold engine. This PID is used in conjunction with the long-term fuel trims, short-term fuel trims, O2 sensor, and injector duty cycle to detect air-fuel ratio problems, such as vacuum leaks, leaky injectors, or coolant in the intake. A FOTE ECT, or non-changing O2 sensor will also set this PID to open loop. In essence, the fuel status tells you whether the ECM has that closed circuit relationship between O2 sensor and injector pulse width. AFR, or air fuel ratio sensor. The newer AFR, or wide band O2 sensor, solves the narrow sensing problem of the previous zirconium sensors. These sensors are often called by different names, such as continuous lambda sensors, AFR, or air fuel ratio sensors, LAF, or lean air fuel sensor, and wide range O2 sensor. Regardless of the name, the principle is the same, which is to put the ECM in a better position to control the air fuel mixture. In effect, the wide range O2 sensor can detect the exhaust O2 content way below or above the perfect 14.7 to 1 air to fuel ratio. Such control is needed on new lean burning engines with extremely low emission output levels. The tighter emission regulations is actually driving this newer fuel control technology and in the process making the systems much more complex and difficult to diagnose. Whenever the air fuel mixture is exactly at 14.7 parts of air to one part of fuel, there is no current flow through the AFR sensor. This is precisely what the ECM tries to do with the AFR signal. A properly operating engine will always have very close to 0.00 milliamps of current flow. The ECM commands more or less injector open time to try and keep the AFR sensor as close as possible to 0.00 milliamps. A rich mixture will produce a negative current flow and a lean mixture a positive current flow. This current is converted by the ECM into a voltage PID output. The actual AFR current flow is extremely small and for this reason the AFR sensor signal should be monitored with a scan tool such as this one. Be advised that this PID signal will not cycle like a regular O2 sensor. The AFR sensor is a current device. This PID value is normalized or converted to look like a regular O2 sensor with a range of 0.1 to 0.9 volts. But the PID will not cycle. Expect to see close to 0.50 or half a volt with a normally working engine. 
This corresponds to lambda 0.00, or perfect air fuel ratio. Goose the throttle, and you should see the opposite of a normal O2 sensor. The lean mixture will output a high voltage from 0.6 to 0.9 volts. And a rich condition will output a low voltage or from 0.4 to 0.1 volt. This is normal and it is a converted voltage value of AFR current to voltage. The commanded air status provides data information on the air injection system. OBD2 systems employ an electric air pump and valves to route fresh air into the exhaust manifold during engine warm-up. The electric air injection system only operates when the engine is cold. The system provides excess air to the exhaust manifold to drive the O2 sensors lean, making the ECM create a wider injector pulse, adding more fuel to the exhaust and therefore heat up the converter much faster than normal. With the excess air and fuel entering the exhaust, most systems reach closed loop and converter operating temperature in under 2 minutes. Use this PID during engine warm-up to determine if the ECM is commanding air injection. You can also make use of this PID during bidirectional control when actuating the air injection pump motor. Another indication of how well this system is operating is by monitoring the O2 sensors during warm-up. The O2 sensors will go lean as soon as air enters the exhaust manifold with a voltage reading of under 0.2 volts. The number of DTCs stored in the ECM's memory is vital. This is especially important when a vehicle fails OBD2 state inspections, ordering a fault, and the check engine light is not on. There are many reasons why this may be happening. 1. The fault is intermittent, and the code set in criteria for it allows for the check engine light to turn off if the fault is no longer present after a number of key cycles. 2. The check engine light bulb is out and there's no way of knowing if the vehicle has a problem with no symptoms. And, it may be a manufacturer's P1 code and not required for the check engine light to turn on. This window will be flagged red if there are codes present. On rare occasions a manufacturer code may not register on this PID. This is due to manufacturer ECM programming variations. So to recap, if this PID shows codes present and the check engine light is off, then there is a fault with the light bulb, the instrument cluster, or the light was removed. On the other hand, if this PID shows a code present and no check engine light, turn the ignition key on with engine off to verify the check engine light operation. If OK, then you have a soft, manufacturer, or intermittent code. The command DGR given in percentage, depends on the control and feedback system employed. If an on and off soloid is used, then with the solenoid off, the output should be 0%, and with the solenoid on, the output is 100%. On a duty cycled or pulse control DGR system, this PID shows a value between 0.00% and 100%. The same holds true for linear or electronic stepper motor EGR valves. In these cases the PID shows a percentage of maximum output of open value. This PID may be used in conjunction with the O2 sensor and a vacuum gauge to detect EGR actuation. If the vehicle is lightly preloaded or power braked, then the EGR is actuated on and a change should be seen at the O2 sensor or vacuum gauge. It is possible that the ECM is commanding the GR to 100% and the system is simply clogged and not operational. This PID shows if the ECM is limiting the GR system for some reason or there are EGR codes present. In certain instances, the ECM may put the GR system out of commission, such as during some misfires, ECD problems, or EGR backfeed sensor faults. In these faulty cases, the engine tends to ping excessively for no apparent reason. So again, the command EGR value pertains to how much EGR flow the ECM is commanding. And, it is very intertwined to the type of EGR feedback system. The EGR feedback could be an EGR temperature sensor, EGR lift sensor, DPFE sensor, a map or boost sensor for vacuum, and the ECM may even use the O2 sensors to detect when the EGR opens. An open EGR will show up as a rich O2 signal. Then, 
If the ECM commands the GR to open and no feedback is detected, it will change the commanded status as needed to try and compensate. If the feedback system is skewed, then the command DGR status PID will also be skewed. The ECT, or engine coolant temperature sensor is an analog input to the ECM. This sensor is a main ECM input and sets the base injection and ignition characteristics. The ECT sensor also tells the ECM when to go to closed loop as soon as a pre-selected warm-up temperature has been reached. With a low ECT value the ECM will also deactivate the GR system, ignore the O2 sensor, stay in open loop, and leave the cooling fans off. Be aware that if the ECM is not grounded properly, the ECT will report the wrong temperature. A fast way to ascertain if the ECM has a good ground is to test it right at the OVD2 DLC or data link connector. Use pin number 5 or sensor ground to test ECM ground. This wire comes directly from the ECM. Pin number 4 is chassis ground. The ECT is also a negative temperature coefficient sensor so that as temperature goes up voltage output goes down. Typically CD voltages are 4.5 volts with engine cold and close to 0.55 volts at 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Just remember, use the ECT PID to know whether the ECM is controlling the mixture. If this PID shows OL, then the ECM is not looking at the O2 sensor at all. And fuel consumption is completely skewed. The engine load is a calculated PID. The ACM takes the RPM, TPS, and the MAP or mass airflow sensor into consideration when calculating the engine load. Some manufacturers report this parameter with a negative load factor included. In other words, if a vehicle is traveling downhill its momentum would be driving the engine, creating a negative load condition or high vacuum. This value would be factored into the overall load PID value, therefore. The normal load values would always be higher than for other manufacturers that don't take negative load values into account. The importance of this PID is that it alerts the technician of any illegal or erroneous load condition placed on the engine. Example. If the customer complains of excessive fuel consumption, look to the calculated load PID for a higher than normal value. If for example the power steering switch is shorted and always staying on, the ECM will increase fuel injector pulse and try to compensate for the supposedly added load. In this case, there would be high fuel consumption and a higher load factor seen on the scanner. The load factor is a great indicator of non-expected or faulty stress placed on the engine. The IAT or intake air temperature sensor is a secondary analog input to the ECM. It tells the ECM the temperature of the incoming air. On engines with the IAT screwed into the intake manifold, it is called an air charge sensor. A high air charge sensor temperature reading is a good indication of a clogged exhaust. The reason being is that the backed up exhaust gases accumulate on the intake manifold, causing the high air charge sensor temperature reading. This signal is used by the ECM to fine tune fuel injection and ignition timing. The mass airflow sensor is a main input to the ACM. It uses this sensor, in combination with other signals, to calculate engine load, which is used to correct for injector and ignition timing. The mass airflow represents the amount of air entering the engine. Typical mass airflow values are 4 to 8 grams per second at idle and 16 to 21 grams per second at 2500 RPM. A MAP fuel injection system behaves differently than a mass airflow one under a large vacuum leak. A large vacuum leak will lower engine vacuum making the ECM think that a high load condition exists. The end result is a huge fuel increase to the injectors, foul plugs, carbonized throttle body, etc. So the engine will run very rich. On a mass airflow system a lean condition will make the mass airflow signal less air entering the engine. The ACM then lower injection pulse and the engine ends up running very lean. Be aware that if the ECM is not grounded properly, the mass airflow sensor will report the wrong value. A fast way to ascertain if the ECM has a good ground is to test it right at the OVD2 DLC or data link connector. 
You spin number 5 sensor ground to test ECM ground. This wire comes directly from the ECM. Pin number 4 is chassis ground. The MAP sensor is a main input to the ECM. It uses the sensor, in combination with other signals, to calculate engine load, which is used to correct for injector and ignition timing. The MAP value is a measure of the pressure within the intake manifold relative to the atmospheric pressure. Typical MAP values are around 40 kPa, at idle or 1.25 volts, or 10.0 to 12.0 inches of mercury. MAP sensor vacuum should not be confused with manifold vacuum. Manifold vacuum is the standard reading seen on a vacuum gauge. MAP vacuum is atmospheric pressure minus manifold vacuum. In essence, the MAP sensor is a differential pressure sensor. It measures the difference in pressure between the outside pressure, or atmospheric, and the intake manifold pressure. A MAP fuel injection system behaves differently than a mass airflow one under a large vacuum leak. A large vacuum leak will lower engine vacuum making the ECM think that a high load condition exists. The end result is a huge fuel increase to the injectors, fouled plugs, carbonized throttle body, etc. So the engine will run very rich. Simply remember, low MAP equals high load and lots of fuel going to the engine. Use the load PID together with MAP to verify the correct fuel need. And always check the MAP vacuum hose to make sure it is working properly. Finally, this PID may also be present even if the vehicle doesn't have a MAP sensor. In this case, the MAP PID is calculated from the mass airflow sensor. So a problem there will also skew the MAP reading. The O2 sensor short-term fuel trim PID, seen here with the O2 sensor voltage, is not the same fuel trim as for for the engine. This is the actual fuel control, or lambda value, air fuel ratio, as it pertains to the oxygen sensor only. In essence, it is a value of O2 sensor air fuel control loop. So the O2 sensor fuel trims, rarely shown in other scan tools, is exactly what the O2 sensor is seeing at that particular point in time. O2 sensor voltage, bank 1 sensor 1, shows the calculated voltage value for the O2 sensor. Bank 1 refers to the V-type engine cylinder bank, corresponding to cylinder number 1. Sensor 1 refers to the pre- or before converter front O2 sensor. This voltage should fluctuate between 0.10 volts and 0.85 volts. The voltage signal should also change at least once per second. If hard to see, use the graphing feature to see the actual waveform. Or go to the automated test section for a full automation test of the O2 sensor. Goose the throttle and make sure that the above values are reached. Make sure the O2 sensor is not stuck in one value, which may be due to a broken O2 sensor wire. O2 sensors bank 1 sensor 1 and bank 2 sensor 1 are the best indicators of the air fuel ratio. The regular zirconium O2 sensor is designed to operate within a very narrow air fuel ratio range, or at close to 14.7 to 1. By simply analyzing the O2 sensor voltage graph, a quick assessment can be ascertained regarding the air fuel control operation. These narrow range O2 sensors are being slowly phased out by the wide range O2 sensor, also called AFR, or air fuel ratio sensor. The O2 sensor short term fuel trim PID, seen here with the O2 sensor voltage, is not the same fuel trim as for the engine. This is the actual fuel control, or lambda value, air fuel ratio, as it pertains to the oxygen sensor only. In essence, it is a value of O2 sensor air fuel control loop. So the O2 sensor fuel trims, rarely shown in other scan tools, is exactly what the O2 sensor is seeing at that particular point in time. O2 sensor voltage for sensor 2 shows the after converter O2 sensor voltage for bank 2 or opposite to cylinder 1 bank of cylinders. The after converter O2 sensor voltage should not fluctuate too much. The proper value should show a 0.60 to 0.30 maximum voltage swing with the engine at 2500 RPM. Test this PID after the engine has set for 10 minutes and converters are cold. 
After startup, rev the engine a couple of times and make sure the O2 voltage value reaches 0.20 and 0.80 volts. This shows a good response. Because of the rear O2 sensor, the ACM may set erroneous catalytic converter codes when in fact there's nothing wrong with the converter. When faced with a converter code, always double check the operation of all rear O2 sensors. The exception to the rule are the newer baby converters, which look like very small converters close to the exhaust manifold, called LOC, or low oxygen storage units. In this system, the rear O2 sensor will almost follow the front O2 sensor. There will always be a maximum of 150 milliseconds of response lag time between the front and rear O2 sensor. This is hard to measure and can only be done with an oscilloscope. If faced with a converter code in one of these systems, simply do an oxygen sensor response test mentioned before. If the O2 sensor responds properly then the converter is faulty. The rear O2 sensor's job is always the same, to test the catalytic converter. On 2004 and up vehicles, the ACM may also use the rear O2 sensor to fine-tune injection, but to a much lesser degree. You can also use the automated O2 sensor tests here in the ADP Scan 1 to determine O2 sensor operation. The O2 sensor short term fuel trim PID, seen here with the O2 sensor voltage, is not the same fuel trim as for, for the engine. This is the actual fuel control, or lambda value, air fuel ratio, as it pertains to the oxygen sensor only. In essence, it is a value of O2 sensor air fuel control loop. So the O2 sensor fuel trims, rarely shown in other scan tools, is exactly what the O2 sensor is seeing at that particular point in time. O2 sensor voltage, bank 1 sensor 3, shows the calculated voltage value for the O2 sensor. Bank 1 refers to the V-type engine cylinder bank, corresponding to cylinder opposite to number 1. Sensor 3 refers to the O2 sensor after the Y pipe. This voltage should fluctuate between 0.10 volts and 0.85 volts. The voltage signal should also change at least once per second. If hard to see, use the graphing feature to see the actual waveform. Or go to the automated test section for a full automation test of the O2 sensor. Goose the throttle and make sure that the above values are reached. Make sure the O2 sensor is not stuck in one value, which may be due to a broken O2 sensor wire. O2 sensors Bank 1 Sensor 1, Bank 1 Sensor 3, and Bank 2 Sensor 1 are the best indicators of the air-fuel ratio. The regular zirconium O2 sensor is designed to operate within a very narrow air-fuel ratio range, or at close to 14.7 to 1. By simply analyzing the O2 sensor voltage graph, a quick assessment can be ascertained regarding the air fuel control operation. These narrow range O2 sensors are being slowly phased out by the wide range O2 sensor, also called AFR, or air fuel ratio sensor. The O2 sensor short term fuel trim PID, seen here with the O2 sensor voltage, is not the same fuel trim as for, for the engine. This is the actual fuel control, or lambda value, air fuel ratio, as it pertains to the oxygen sensor only. In essence, it is a value of O2 sensor air fuel control loop. So the O2 sensor fuel trims, rarely shown in other scan tools, is exactly what the O2 sensor is seeing at that particular point in time. O2 sensor voltage, bank 2 sensor 1, shows the calculated voltage value for the O2 sensor. Bank 2 refers to the V-type engine cylinder bank, corresponding to cylinder opposite to number 1. Sensor 1 refers to the pre- or before converter front O2 sensor. This voltage should fluctuate between 0.10 volts and 0.85 volts. The voltage signal should also change at least once per second. If hard to see, use the graphing feature to see the actual waveform or go to the automated test section for a full automation test of the O2 sensor. Goose the throttle and make sure that the above values are reached. Make sure the O2 sensor is not stuck in one value, which may be due to a broken O2 sensor wire. O2 sensors Bank 1 Sensor 1 and Bank 2 Sensor 1 are the best indicators of the air-fuel ratio. 
The regular Zirconia Mo2 sensor is designed to operate within a very narrow air fuel ratio range, or at close to 14.7 to 1. By simply analyzing the O2 sensor voltage graph, a quick assessment can be ascertained regarding the air fuel control operation. These narrow range O2 sensors are being slowly phased out by the wide range O2 sensor, also called AFR, or air fuel ratio sensor. The O2 sensor short term fuel trim PID, seen here with the O2 sensor voltage, is not the same fuel trim as for the engine. This is the actual fuel control, or lambda value, air fuel ratio, as it pertains to the oxygen sensor only. In essence, it is a value of O2 sensor air fuel control loop. So the O2 sensor fuel trims, rarely shown in other scan tools, is exactly what the O2 sensor is seeing at that particular point in time. O2 sensor voltage for bank 2 sensor 2 shows the after converter O2 sensor voltage for bank 2 or opposite to cylinder 1 bank of cylinders. The after converter O2 sensor voltage should not fluctuate too much. The proper value should show a 0.60 to 0.30 maximum voltage swing with the engine at 2500 RPM. Test this PID after. The engine has set for 10 minutes and converters are cold. After startup, rev the engine a couple of times and make sure the O2 voltage value reaches 0.20 and 0.80 volts. This shows a good response. Because of the rear O2 sensor, the ACM may set erroneous catalytic converter codes when in fact there's nothing wrong with the converter. When faced with a converter code, always double check the operation of all rear O2 sensors. The exception to the rule are the newer baby converters, which look like very small converters close to the exhaust manifold, called LOC, or low oxygen storage units. In this system, the rear O2 sensor will almost follow the front O2 sensor. There will always be a maximum of 150 milliseconds of response lag time between the front and rear O2 sensor. This is hard to measure and can only be done with an oscilloscope. If faced with a converter code in one of these systems, simply do an oxygen sensor response test mentioned before. If the O2 sensor responds properly then the converter is faulty. The rear O2 sensor's job is always the same, to test the catalytic converter. On 2004 and up vehicles, the ACM may also use the rear O2 sensor to fine-tune injection, but to a much lesser degree. You can also use the automated O2 sensor tests here in the ADP Scan 1 to determine O2 sensor operation. The O2 sensor location simply denotes the amount of available O2 sensors in the system. There are two reasons why this is important. To determine if the right ECM or correct flash software has been installed. Oftentimes the customer had the ECM replaced or reflashed somewhere else and the vehicle is not running at all. So if you're working on a four-cylinder engine and the O2 location shows four O2 sensors, then the wrong ECM was installed. The other reason deals with newer systems with multiple O2 sensors. It is now common to see 2004 and up OBD2 vehicles with four-cylinders engines and four O2 sensors. This problem may even get tougher when V6 and V8 engines hit the market. This PID helps determine that you're using the right ECM or reflash for the vehicle in question. The RPM is a calculated value arrived at from the crankshaft position sensor or the ignition module pickup coil input to the ECM. The RPM is a main input and should always be considered when analyzing any PID group. A common mistake made by technicians is to use the RPM reading to verify crank sensor operation. It is possible to get an RPM reading with a faulty crank sensor. In this case the ACM will simply substitute a value at the data stream output. All crank sensor tests should be finalized with the proper manual measurements using an oscilloscope like the ADP Scope 1 or multimeter. The RPM, MAP or Mass Airflow and the TPS PID are the main inputs to the ACM. With those three PIDs, you can start any engine. The absolute throttle position reports the TPS value taking into account the offset. 
so that at 0.00 volts this PID will read 0.00% and at 5.00 volts it will read 100%. TPS is a main input to the ECM, which is used to calculate the throttle plate's rate of opening, transmission shift points, engine load, and various other control loops. Most TPS today are auto-zeroing. This means that whenever the ignition key is cycled off-on, the ECM assumes the lowest TPS value as the minimum or closed throttle position. The problem with this feature is that in the event of a signal loss or dropout, the ECM sets the faulty signal as the closed throttle position, creating severe drivability problems. Another quirky note on the OVD2 TPS PID is that it rarely reaches 100%. Most vehicles set the maximum TPS at not higher than 80%. Here in the ADP Scan 1, this PID is also given with a calculated voltage value to help in the diagnosis. This value should always be compared with the actual value measured at the sensor itself. Also check ECM ground at its connector or at pin number 5 of the DLC connector. A skewed TPS ground will make it output the wrong signal, causing transmission shifting and drivability problems. The ignition timing advance PID is a calculated value of the actual ECM controlled ignition timing. Typical normal values at idle should range from 10 to 20 degrees with a warm engine. This PID is useful when trying to determine if the system is in limpin mode since manufacturers lock ignition timing in one position when in limpin mode. The ignition timing is also used to fine tune the idle speed. This technique may also be employed on drive-by-wire systems as well. By controlling ignition timing, you can fine-tune the idle speed without the idle air control motor or drive-by-wire motor. Goose the throttle and observe if this PID changes. If locked in one value, then the ECM is in limpin mode due to a faulty condition. This PID also shows how far the ECM is controlling timing to reduce knock. So a skewed reading may also be due to a faulty knock sensor. On older OVD2 systems, a separate timing retard module may be used to retard timing, which may or may not show up on this PID. The VSS or Vehicle Speed Sensor PID is usually taken from the VSS sensor itself. However, in newer OBD2 systems, and in most future systems, the VSS sensor is eliminated and vehicle speed is taken from the ABS computer. The ABS computer makes an algorithmic or calculated analysis of all four or front wheel speed sensors, and then output a PID to the data stream. In the event that no VSS PID value is present and you don't see an actual VSS sensor on the transmission, the data is being taken at the ABS module. You then have to concentrate on the ABS module and the wheel speed sensors to find the specific fault. This signal input is also a main transmission input. Without VSS signaling the transmission will shift improperly or not shift at all. The VSS signal is also used to run various other monitors or tests that need a vehicle speed input. It is also used to command various other components like the GR and purge valves. Scan 1 Automated Testing Software The Scan 1 Diagnostic System has 14 modes or sections of diagnostics. One of these is the Automated Testing section. With Automated Testing, this scanner software is placed in stealth mode. What it does is access the vehicle's PID or parameters at up to 10 times per second and record them in memory. Each test lasts a specific number of seconds or between 20 to 90 seconds, depending on the test. Then, automatically, the software runs the recorded test data through a proprietary algorithm and comes up with a repair diagnosis. Tests such as all oxygen sensors, including the rear ones, lean condition on both banks, clogged catalytic converter, converter efficiency, baby catalytic converters testing, and many other sensors and tests are included. This is a fully proprietary technology. It is not part of OBD2 or any other scan tool. What we at Automotive Diagnostics and Publishing did was develop the algorithms for testing these components and systems 
Future tests are included in the software update, as there is no charge on updates now, or at any time in the future. That's our promise. Here's an example, for testing the O2 sensor, EdBank 1, Sensor 1. Here are the details. 1. First, you get a brief description of the test. 2. Then, you also get brief instructions, on doing the test, like accelerate to 2000 RPMs, or step on brakes, depending on the test. 3. Then, you're given the option of choosing, slow or fast testing. The slow test is 10 times more accurate, but, you may just want a preliminary sampling, for baselining the system. Here's what the test says after it has run. PASS, but rich O2 sensor, average voltage value, is higher than the normal range. This may be due to issues unrelated to the O2 sensor. Possible reasons, evap canister full. Cracked cylinder head, letting coolant into the combustion chamber, leaky injector, or pressure regulator. The high average voltage reading detected here is a minor issue, but it is intended to alert you to third possible pending problems. This O2 sensor reading is higher than normal. However, the scan 102 test shows that the front oxygen sensor is working at 73% efficiency. This O2 sensor is passing the test and should not need replacement. Keep in mind that the front O2 sensor may stop cycling when the vehicle is left to idle for longer than 5 to 7 minutes eye feeder is not working, or sensor is sluggish. To be sure, perform this test again after the engine is idled for such time. The Scan 1 automated test feature has been growing for a few years now. This section will always continue to grow and reflect the new sensors and components that are and will be introduced now and in the future. So, in a sense, the Scan 1 automated testing feature will never be obsolete. We hope you've enjoyed watching. The Automotive Waveform Database Software Having your own automotive waveform library is a must in today's auto repair and diagnostics. The reason to have a waveform database is to make comparisons to other cases or instances. How often have you said to yourself, I wonder if this sensor signal is right? Well, here's the Automotive Waveform Database Software to the rescue. As you can see, this software is a simple one. It is loaded with hundreds of different waveforms, many of them with field explanations and analysis. You also get loads of scan tool PID or parameter graphs. Yes, the hardest part of using a scan tool is, well, using a scan tool. Interpreting the data is super tough. The waveform database goes a long way into helping you get some insights on scanner waveforms, for the most part, which parameters you compare is tough decision. In this software, Many of the scanner PID waveforms also have explanations that were put there fresh during the repair process. Lots of scenarios are covered, such as ignition waveforms, good and bad injectors, mass airflow sensors, ignition coils primary and secondary, lean cylinder ignition effect, pressure transducer, fuel flow to determine clogged injectors and clogged exhaust, power and ground tests. ECM injector and sensor ground tests, pre and post catalytic converter scanner PID graphs, CAM and crank sensors, ignition spark signal waveforms, O2 sensors and air fuel ratio sensors, duty cycle analysis for many components, such as solenoids and injectors, good and bad scans for many makes and models, cars computer network bus signals, and tons of any other possible scenarios you could think of. The waveforms and pictures are recataloged into types, manufacturer, and symptom, if applicable. This is a great tool for any do-it-yourselfer or professional technician. Hope you enjoy. Automotive Repair Software Catalog We now offer 
all the updated versions of our long-standing PC-based auto repair software to our viewers. If you're a small auto repair shop or you like to work on your own car, then our products are the most cost-effective on the market. Here, you can also link to the different software products. The ASE8 Automotive Examination Interactive Study Core Software This is a complete, only the kind, interactive software that will prepare you to pass the ASE8 exam. It has videos, diagrams, and text information for the A8 Engine Performance Exam which is a requirement for all state inspection certifications. The Climate Control Troubleshooter Repair Software This software is meant to guide you and give you all the information you need to tackle today's electronic climate control system repairs. It covers all domestic or U.S. and Asian models. The repair coverage is vast and complete. The No Start Troubleshooter Auto Repair Software this is a one-of-a-kind software. It covers all kinds of no-start conditions like no injector pulse, no fuel pressure, no spark, no oid pulse, but no fuel, and any combination therefore. A complete solution for all no-start conditions. The OBD2 Troubleshooter Auto Repair Software is a guided three-step process to diagnosing Ali or OBD2 auto repair needs. Excellent for any repair shop shop emission or IM program that guides you in even resetting the OBD2 monitors. Perfect combination for OBD2 and your care shop. The OBD2 Secret Weapon Auto Repair Software is also a great complement to any emissions inspection and repair shop. It is also bundled with our waveform database. This is an alternative out of the OBD2 troubleshooter. It is complete when it comes to all your OBD2 repair needs. OBD2 covers all US, Asian, and European cars from 1996 to now. The SRS Airbag Troubleshooter Auto Repair Software is a total solution to any SRS Airbag Repair Shop or Body Shop Mechanic. It is complete and even covers airbag resistive values so the two can substitute the airbag for the proper resistor during repairs. The Scan1 Intelligent Diagnostic System is the most advanced PC-based OBD2 scanner in the field today. It has loads of repair help, DTC or code video troubleshooters, PID video help, red flag parameter values, advanced graphing, mode 6, misfire counters, and much more. You may download a demonstration version right here for a try before you buy experience. This software, like all our software, runs on all versions of Microsoft Windows, like XP, Vista, 7 and 8 Pro. There's also a Scan 1 Lite version for the home mechanic, which, like the larger Scan 1, runs in any Elm 327 compatible interface. As you can see, this is a small snippet of our biggest selling software production collection. We also have a wide variety of Android APPs on Google Play. Let us know if you have questions, as you should, and how we can point you in the right direction when it comes to software products and automotive repair solutions. We hope you enjoy. This channel is for do-it-yourselfers, as well as professional auto repair technicians. We present all the content using the latest CG animation techniques, on hands video, and how to, tips and techniques. We encourage you to subscribe to this channel now. Once subscribed, anytime we upload a new automotive tip, secret, or technology video, you will be notified. Finally, by subscribing, you will also be part of our weekly freebies. Yes, we're constantly giving away lots of free merchandise. Automotive Diagnostics and Publishing's Mandy Concepcion, the owner of this channel, is one of the most prolific auto technology authors on the web. At any moment in time, we may offer a free book, Kindle e-book, Android app, one of our own diagnostic equipment, or even auto repair software that runs on your PC. Subscribe now free of charge, learn lots of automotive technology secrets, and win free stuff. It doesn't get any better than that. 
Thanks for watching and enjoy.